Well, as he said, my name's Dave. I'm one of the pastors here. Just real quick, there's some prayer blankets in the back. One is, uh, you know, there was a collection with Karen where there's healing. Do we still do a blanket? Absolutely, we do a rejoicing blanket. So that's in the back, and there's also one back there for Rosemary. And there's also a basket. There's been some confusion with Pam uh, Heinlein as far as people giving cards or meal trains or anything. And there's no, there's no pressure here, but we've... we've um, not had any really real clear direction. So there's a basket in the back, and there'll probably be one there next week, too. If you want to give them a card, like a Publix card, or just a card of encouragement or anything like that, that's back there, So just so that's clear. And then I just want to give a shout-out to the graduates, a personal shout-out to Logan, who has graduated nursing. Let's give it up. I watched that guy grow up from a wee lad, and I watched the other kids grow up from a wee lad, except Julia. I've just got the pleasure of meeting her, so it's a wonderful thing to watch her grow into a wonderful young lady. And are you doing really doing jury duty? Oh, man. Thanks a lot, Mike. Anyway, I'm excited to be here today. Are you? All right, we've got the center right here. They're excited to be here. Glory to God. You know, Andy made a mention of... Um, Psalm 37, 4 of delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. So delight yourself in the Lord, that's a choice. It's a choice you make to press into that. And the Greek word for as far as delight or Hebrew word for delight is lean into. So it's a choice to lean into. So then as you think about it, if he'll give you the desires of your heart, man, that's a jumping catfish opportunity of a golden ticket. Delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Desire of your heart is a thousand cattle on hills in the Grand Canyon, right? Right? No, that's not what it is. I believe truly it changes the desires of our heart because we're delighting ourselves in the Lord. And as we start to look in Psalm 1 today, I just had this burning in my heart for a while and praying through what to preach on. I really felt like this is such a message that if we can grab a hold of it, it can change your life. I mean radically change your life into the realm of your understanding of who God is. Because I think sometimes we religiously create God in our own mind, in our own little box here. We create a lot of yeses and nos of things of which we can't do. And I can't step that far out there because you get into this zone where it starts to waffle back and forth in only my head, not yours, but mine. Maybe you think I'm not, but I'm kidding. Anyway, it gives us opportunity to plug into this place that can transform us through the word of God. So let me pray real quick. Lord, we just come again together with you. And we ask by your spirit to bring life to your word. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, the power that you've given us, the place that we can sit in your presence is unmeasurable. It's un nothing else can compare to it. So Lord, we pray today for just a small glimpse of that revelation. Ignite not my words, but your words into the hearts of the people that are sitting here today. And Lord, I pray that you would give us that, that revelation of the opportunity you've given us to sit at your feet. In Jesus' name, amen. So a quick question, it's rhetorical, obviously. Uh, what do you delight in? Are you thinking? So now that you've figured out what you delight in, is it God? Because I think for a lot of us, we've, we've gone to church for many years of our life. I was thinking today, this year will be 37 years I've been a believer. And I'm like, wow. First I kick myself because I think I should be farther along. And then I realized the opportunity of the greatness that God did in that moment of bringing me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light 37 years ago. And the time that it's taken to step and to be and to, to do and to understand who God is, I'm still learning. I haven't learned it. And it's an amazing concept as we journey on. So for the graduates, I just want to say Psalm 119, 105 to you. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I truly believe that if you embrace this, no matter the journey you go on, the choice of career, the things of which you're going to do, the gap year you run in, it's going to be the time where you step back and he'll always be faithful to direct you if you're faithful to stay into his word. He's a faithful God and will never leave you or forsake you. Congratulations to all of you. It's a huge, huge step. So Psalm 1, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked <clears throat> or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. 
And on, this, on his law, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff. And the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There's two ways. There's the way of the righteous, and there's the way of the wicked. Jesus said it again in Matthew 7, 13, where he says there's a wide gate and there's a narrow gate. And as hard as it is and as reality is, is we live in a culture now that has blended everything together to where it's, it's wide open. Whatever I pretty much want to do and then tack Jesus on the end, I'm good. If I want to go to church, I'll go to church. If I don't want to go to church, I don't need to go to church. There's a big movement that says we don't need to be in the building. And you know what? There's a part of that that's right. But the other part of that is what about the community? What about the accountability that comes along? What about the aspect of where we, we find ourselves held accountable? Because somebody hasn't seen you. Maybe they reach out to you and they tap you on the shoulder and you're like, hey, I haven't seen you in a few weeks and you've been struggling and that was the tap that you needed to be brought back. As we delight ourselves in the Lord, he's faithful to show us him. As we lean into him, as we delight ourselves in the word, Hebrews says the word is powerful and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. Do you believe that? Because if we believe that, and I'm speaking to myself here, we would put more merit to the word of God. Not that it's the word of God, but the time spent in it, meditating on it, taking the choice to, to listen to what God's saying. You know, Psalm 1 says, those who seek independence from God, they're the wicked. They have human earthly perspective. Those who live according to word, the world's standards are not, and not God's. And at times this way appears to be a way of success, acceptance, and prosperity. And if you read through some of the Psalms, it's a battle pushing back and forth of whoever the author of that particular Psalm is, is pushing back and saying, you know what, Lord, I don't understand. I'm struggling. I look across the way and the wicked are thriving. Things are all going their way, but I have nothing. And it's not a matter of comparison in that realm it's a matter of being contented and successful and as he talks about here he compares the two of the righteous and the wicked and the wicked is those that want independence from god the alternative is a life dependent on delight in divine instruction the righteous recognize the poverty of the world's wisdom the values and so orient their lives around god's revealed word this is the life of faith that leads to blessing fruitfulness fellowship with God now and forever. Think of a beautiful, sturdy, well-watered, fruitful tree and be the tree and not the chaff. Now, in our culture, we don't really know what a lot of chaff is. Some of you guys out from Iowa, Nebraska, North Dakota, and those places, you might know what chaff is. is that, I'm sure I'm saying it right, chaff, not chafe, because we know what chafe is, and we don't want that, it's chaff. So chaff is the extra part of the wheat of which they didn't need. So they would bring this in, and they would beat it on the threshing floor, and then in that, they would... Sh- flip it up, and the wind would blow away the chaff, and then the wind would also blow a little bit further the stalk, and then the the berry would fall. So they could pick up the straw, use that for another thing, but the chaff was worthless. So as he points out here and he contrasts the righteous and the wicked, he's basically saying they're worthless in that realm. Now, God would never say that they're worthless, but in the environment of the choice of living in this environment, they are choosing the worthless path because he compares them to chaff. And chaff is just gone, blown away. There's nothing there. So verse 2 is the key, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So it's delight and then meditation. Before we go any further, there's three degrees of separation in the first section of that verse. And it's you sit, you walk, and you stand with sinners. This is what he says he doesn't do. But those that choose to live in that wicked begin to walk. They begin to hang out with whatever's in the, in the culture. They begin to listen to whatever's in the culture. I think if we think back and we think of Lot and Abraham and the story there, Lot chose that beautiful Lot. I think that was the last time I preached I talked on that. But anyway, he chose, Lot chose the beautiful Lot right down by the Lot of everything. So in that, he began to sit, he began to walk, and he began to be. 
And as the wicked begin to slowly step away, the part that we all struggle with, myself included, as we journey on in our Christian walk, is complacency. It's the place where we start to become a little comfortable. It's the place where we move forward and we think maybe we know more than what we do, but really we know less than what we thought. So in that concept, we begin to compromise. And maybe it's not hardcore sin, but it's choosing not to give the priority place as we delight in the word. We meditate on the word. So in the realm of delight to meditation, delight is a response of the heart to the beauty and the value of something or someone, in this case, God's word. Meditation involves a sustained thought. It takes work and it involves the will. So in meditation, I know probably you suddenly saw a yogi sitting in a lotus position in his transcendental meditation moment. Well, I'll be here to tell you that God first invented meditation and then the others came along and counterfeited it and brought him to another place that really wasn't in that place, but to a place where they became more wicked. So meditation, taking it in, chewing it over. I'm sure you've heard this before, where you are like a cow. And you're not a cow. I'm not calling you a cow by any means. You can call me a cow. That's fine. But they chew on it. They bring it back up, and they chew on it. They bring it back up, and they chew on it. And they constantly bring this over in a repetitive form. And it's the same with he meditates on it day and night. So the word says, blessed is the man who does not walk. Okay, what does that mean? How do I process that? Blessed, happy, happy. And it's not happy as, hey, happy. You know, what was that guy who wrote that song, happy, happy? You know, I say there's a singing of it, but anyway, I know what it is, and you do too, but you're just not acknowledging that. That's why I'm standing here feeling awkward. But that's okay, because I'm happy. Blessed means happy, but it's not happy in the sense that I woke up happy. It's happy in the sense that he's fulfilled in all aspects and areas of his life. So blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel, but he meditates day and night on the law. So in that concept of meditation, it begins to transform. It begins to change. You've all been around people that use perhaps words that you don't particularly like, and the more that you're around those people, you begin to absorb some of those words if you don't choose to take a stance against it. Environments, thoughts, the text also says here, because he meditates, he doesn't submit himself to the counsel of the wicked. We live in a world that is directionally guiding us. Andy, I think, brought it out, and so did Mike, in the realm of the culture in which we live right now. There's a direction. There's a bent that's taking place in steering us. And how does one know the truth if they don't know the truth? The counterfeit comes in, and the original gets clouded. And then suddenly we change it just a, a little bit. And now we're confused. But if we stand true on the word of God and we delight in it, then the things of which God does, we know for a fact because it's changed us and we go back to the word and the word doesn't change. Meditation done well will serve, strengthen, and sustain delight. Meditation allows the word to penetrate our minds, hearts, and wills more deeply. Through meditation, we are transformed by the renewal of our mind. Romans 12 says, Do not be conformed to this world any longer, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind the word of God transforming them. And then the next verse after that says, but do not think more highly than you should of yourself. That's the other side of the snippet that spins as we start to journey on. If I know more, well, I really don't need to do this anymore because, you know, I've been a Christian for 37 years. Do I really need to get up and have devotions in the morning anymore? Because I know God. I know a lot of scripture in my own mind. So do I need that? Absolutely more. Need it more than then before. Why? Because I am a human man. I am fallible. I am selfish, I am disorganized, I am mean. Without God, all those things are real. All those things are there. And those are the things of which God is changing us and molding us by spending time in the Word. And I think one of the things that I found in my journey is the Word is underappreciated. Because sometimes we don't understand it. We don't understand what He's saying. And how are you going to learn it if you can't understand it? But spend time in it. Reach out. Man, the resources today are amazing. The number one factor that Jesus said was, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. How do you know his voice unless you spend time in the word? Because you can plug into a church that's got a whole different view of Jesus. And if that's the Jesus that you're adhering to, it's not this Jesus. It's back to the word. It's back to the part of understanding as we meditate, as we memorize, as the word becomes life within us, it begins to change us. It says he's like a tree planted by the river whose roots go down deep and is not moved. He produces fruit in good season. His leaves do not wither. 
He's planted, he's growing, he's producing fruit. The question you have to ask yourself, and this is a hard reality question, is what is my fruit? Am I growing? Am I planted in the place that's next to the stream, the word? Am I sitting in this place? Because out of that comes the elation of all the other things that come that don't tip us over. All the other stuff that comes down the pipe that's disruptive doesn't disrupt us because we're rooted in the truth. We're rooted in God. But it comes back to the place again of what do I delight in? Do I delight in the, in the Lord? Do I delight in the word? I, I wrestle. Sometimes I'm really delighting and other times I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not lit. That's a good thing. So you've got to understand and ask yourself, what is it? And in those moments, and we'll get into this in a minute, when we do dry up and we do begin to pull back and we don't spend that time, then our leaves begin to wither. Our fruit begins to change. And it begins to question of where do we stand? Are we standing in that place that we're being filled? Are we standing in that place where he's whole? Never reduce Christianity, Christianity to a, a matter of demands and resolutions and willpower. It is a matter of what we do, what we love, what we delight in, what tastes good to us. When Jesus came into the world, humanity was split what they loved. The light came in the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, John 3.19. The righteous and the wicked are separated by what they delight in, the revelation of God or the way of the world. You know, it, it's hard. I wrestle in certain situations of people that I know that are very close to me, and they're choosing some different paths in life. And without invitation, it's really, really difficult to cut the line and say, your way is wrong, my way is right. And in a discussion I had, I was talking with someone. I said, you know, the only thing that's going to change a heart of a person is God. Not me. Not you. God. And you pray into that situation. Because there are only two ways. You're either for him or you're against him. There's no gray zone. So graduates, as you enter into the world and you go into adulting, um, there is no other way. No matter what college you plug into, no matter what work environment you plug into, no matter what scheme of things seems great, there is no other way except the way of righteousness and the way of the wicked. And nobody likes to hear that. But it's all through Scripture, over and over and over. And as we choose to delight in the Lord, I would just encourage you guys to read Psalm 119. It's only 178 verses or something like that. It's a light read, you know, maybe with a snack. Just sit down and read this. That book, that, that chapter, well, let me just share a little bit. I love it. I just read it uh, the other day, on the way to work. No. The, the concepts of what he says in the delight aspect. He says, I rejoice in the following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Direct me in your paths and commands, for there I find delight. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise in your servant. All the way through. If you go back, you jump into this place, God will show you all your direction. And more questions are rising in our time today, especially in young people's lives, as to what is right. What is true? And the only thing that really is right and what is true is the Word of God. And if we don't embrace that spot, then we're in a problem. So loving God's Word is the path to full life. One idea is great satisfaction. Do you get great satisfaction out of the Word? And you might go, no. You know, it's hard to understand some aspects. You know, there's a lot of translations. When I first got saved, I asked my dad, you know, what do I do now? And he sent me a message Bible. I don't know if you guys know what the message Bible is, but... Back then, it was a very easy, it's still a very easy reading Bible. It's paraphrased. It's easy for a guy like myself to understand. Because I had a King James, and I don't know, there's probably some King Jimmy guys out here, but hey, right on, more power to you. Yeah, Pam with the King Jimmy. Yeah, but she also likes the Yankees, so we can give her that. It's a harder one to fully grasp. Just kidding. It's a harder one to grasp within that because of the language within it. It's an easier one to memorize because of the language within it. So translation-wise, find one that fits 
for you. Unless it's some really wonky one that's out there, like the New World Order translation. You don't want that one. Trust me. But find one that connects with you, where you can begin to read it, where you begin to feel that satisfaction. Don't be satisfied with the world. As you compare the two, there's a lot of things out here. And I'm going to challenge you, and you're probably not going to like this, because we're really busy within our life. But don't just take a podcast. Don't just take a Devo that's online and, and listen to it on the way to work. Don't do it. I mean, you are getting fed, yes. But I want to encourage you to get back into the Word. Whether you read it on a device or whether you read it from the text from a book like this, I prefer this. I read a lot on my computer. But when you go back to this and you highlight it and you start making notes like the Bible's in the back, I was so glad Mike got Bibles for the kids. It's wonderful. Please highlight your favorite verse back there because this is where life comes. You know, my goal is to give a Bible to each one of my kids when I'm dead. And to have that Bible not to where the binding isn't broken, but instead to have it where the pages are falling out. And it's so marked up because of my intimacy with God that they can look into that and go, wow, Dad knew God. Not because of what I wrote in the Bible, but because of my life, but because something that they can tangibly have and go, man, my father did that for me. And I read back through and he dated different things that meant certain things to him. So, excuse me, I'm not getting choked up. It means so much because I see what he wrote, what meant something to him. My brother just got saved about a year and a half ago, and my mother gave him one of my other dad's Bibles, and we chat, and he goes, man, this is just amazing. And it's the Word of God. It's the Word of God passing it on to someone else, maybe your family, maybe somebody else. I just encourage you to get into the Word. Let it be your satisfaction. Don't be satisfied with the ease of the age. Not that podcasts are any of that bad. I don't want to say that. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Saturate yourself with the word. As we're back to the tree analogy, we're all living in Florida. We got a little bit of rain today. As you probably know, I mow one day a week, and I've been moving some dirt. I feel like Glenn and I can lock arms because Glenn's a dirt mover, and so am I. Mine doesn't pick it up. His does, but mine blows it everywhere. There's no, the, the moisture factor in Florida, the drought aspect that's taking place here. Saturate yourself in the word. Don't be drought, Christian. You know, I'm reading this book called The End of Religion. And as I read it, I'm really realizing we have created this environment in the church that is so hardcore dogmatic. And in this, you know, he points out one of the first miracles Jesus did was the wedding at the tomb. So the mother says, hey, fill these jugs. So in reading this, there's some detail that comes out of it. So the detail is, is the ceremonial pots of which they filled were to wash, to cleanse themselves before going in out of the religious duty. So if you remember later, the wine was done. She said, do whatever my son tells you. He said, go fill the pot with water. So they go fill this, these pots with water. So they're ceremonial pots, so they're very religious you're not supposed to drink the water, do anything in the water. You're supposed to wash with the water because this meant something symbolically there. So Jesus takes these pots, turns them into wine, and then says, hey, the person that was the head of the place says, what are you doing? You know, he, you were supposed to serve the good wine in the beginning, and then as people have had a bit of wine, they drink the lesser expensive wine. This is like the premium wine. So in doing that, Jesus took their ceremonial pots and turned it and said, you know, we're not going to be of the religious section. We're going to break this side, and we're going to fill this with that. And in the reading of this, there were plenty of other wine jugs he could have filled that were empty because they'd already consumed large amounts. So in the religious aspect, Jesus came in with a specific mindset as he started to reveal himself. Now, you may remember one where the uh, individual was at the pool of Bethesda, or Bethsaida, one of those bees, and the guy couldn't get there because he was lame. You know, that was supposedly it was the angel came and stirred up the pool, and whoever came into the pool first got healed. And this poor guy had been sitting there for years, and he couldn't get there because he couldn't walk. And there was nobody there that would put him in. So Jesus said, what do you want? Well, I'd like to be healed. He says, all right, you're healed. Pick up your mat and walk. So question that I read in here. I wish I had figured out all this by myself, but I can't take credit for that, so I'm just going to be honest. Is he pointed out that it was the Sabbath day that he healed him. One, you're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. But then he told him to pick up your mat and walk. 
Why did he do that? Because on the Sabbath, he was not allowed to pick up his mat and walk because it was work. So when Jesus came in, and this is part of where delighting in the word is going to come back to, is he blew apart the religious structure to say, listen, it's about a relationship with me. It's about connecting with me. And all these things that have been placed in establishment that you're supposed to do in order to be able to have a relationship with me, he says, I'm going to blast each one of them so that you can come unto me and be whole. I think we forget that. I think we forget that in our world. I think we forget the, the concept of what it's about within us. Have you ever thought about the, the feasts that they did? The many different feasts and gatherings together. It was to bring them back to remember. Now in this transition here, remember, remember this. I'm going to go to Revelation 2. To the church at Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you, that, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You've persevered and you have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, and I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Three things he says in there. Remember, repent, and return to your first love. So in the remembering side, they did feasts. They did things. You know of the stories of the Ebenezer stones as they crossed over the river, as the stones that were put into the middle of the Jordan as remembrance stones. Do we do remembrance things? I don't know. But you can remember from the moment that you got saved and you gave your life to Jesus Christ, I hope. Because your life should have changed. It should have radically changed. So remember, do you remember when God first awakened your soul? Do you remember the excitement you had when he plucked you out of darkness? How joyful did you dance from the orphan of a, to a son, a dead sinner to a resurrected saint, an enemy with God to be his beloved, from chaff to a tree, a cedar of Lebanon? The church of Ephesus had great things to remember. There was deliverance from idol worship, the liberation from evil spirits, the many miraculous healings that occurred in the city, the great bonfire where they burned all the occult books and magical incantations, their public repentance before a pagan crowd. From the inception, the Ephesian church radically experienced God. They were a place that did huge things, that people came from all around to learn of this God of which they worshipped and they served. So when he says, remember where you've fallen, all these things you've been saved from and delivered. So for about 30 years, this progresses on. And then Jesus comes and he says, you've lost your first love. You guys were hardcore zealots. You were intense in doing evangelism. You were intense in seeing people saved. But what's happened is, you never grew weary in the testing. But now you have become used to all the function of the machine. And you've no longer put me in the place of being that first love. From the inception of the Ephesian church, these early believers were renowned for their passion for Jesus, their willingness to sever their new lives in Christ from their pagan past, and their aggressive missionary zeal. All of this was part of their history. And they burned like a spiritual inferno, and in the vibrancy of excitement, these Ephesian believers inspired the same passion in other churches. But as years passed, the zeal of the Ephesian church had once possessed for the things of God slowly ebbed away. Knowledge increased, but the believer's passion for Jesus diminished. And undoubtedly, the church grew, so did its members, schedules, routines, habits, customs, traditions. The subtle backsliding that often occurs when Christians consumed with serving God began to take hold in that great church. The Ephesians were busy serving God, but lost their intimacy. This is us. 
This is the modern day culture we live in. We sometimes think that I'm really, I'm really doing well with the Lord because I'm really busy. I've got all this stuff going on ministry-wise and I'm really busy. That's not what it's about. It's about relationship. It's about the concept of coming back and understanding who you are in God and who he is in you. And that comes through delighting in him. It comes through the meditation of his word to allow you to transform you into understanding what you are to God. You are a chosen one. You are the apple of his eye. You are loved by him greatly, so much that he sent his only son to reconcile the relationship for you. But yet we forsake that. We know that. But then we don't keep it in that place to where we honor it. We recognize it. It brings us back to the understanding of what he did for us. What his love is for us. Did you once run to prayer to not get your daily dose of spiritual medicine, but because the great love waited for you there? If we all think back of when we gave our life to the Lord, I, I hope it's a, a pleasant memory of change. For me, it was a radical shift. I was on a fast track to nowhere and wouldn't be here today, hence the Lord hadn't stepped in. And within that concept, years passed. I had the same understanding that as we surrender ourselves to the Lord, all things are under his lordship. But as we journey on, sometimes we kick back a little bit of those things and we say, I can handle this. I can maintain this. Oh, you don't need to watch that anymore, Lord. I'll take care of that. And we slowly find ourselves beginning to walk away, beginning to stand in a different part to the point where for unfortunate people, they backslidden and left the Lord. The guy that was instrumental in my getting, after I got saved in college, that was challenging me, helping me to memorize scripture. Years later, I had heard that he returned to the drug world and had died. But he was very, very poignant in my life at that time. And I look and I go, man, everyone without staying tethered to God and the word is subject to wander, is subject to deception. You've heard my story on being deceived numerous times. I won't bear the sh burden you with that again. But it slowly comes in, and it's not like a two-by-four upside your head. It's a slowly moving away, the ebbing away. You know what the ebbing is? is it's pulling away slowly and gradually until you, once you realize it's gone and you didn't see it happen. And it can happen to all of us because we're busy. We live in a crazy busy world. I don't have time. I'll just hit the podcast. And, and again, I'm not saying that's bad, but it's the moments of intimacy, the quiet times, the places of meditation. George Mueller, you guys know who he is, a lot of orphanages. He was the guy that would pray, God, we need bread, and then suddenly a truck would roll in with a big bunch of load of bread for the kids. He had the concept, as he wrote, I used to go to prayer. And then I'd go to the Word. But then I shifted it. And he said, I would challenge you. I would go to the Word, not to prepare a message for public ministry, not for anything else but my own gain, for my own meditation. And out of that meditation of spending time within that Word came confession, came sanctification, came prayer, came deep intercession. Because the Word was the driving force within it. That's got to be us. That's got to be us to see that the power that lies within the word is worthy of a time where we separate that side out, whether it's get up early, stay up late, skip your lunch, whatever. A place where you get to be alone with God. I prefer in the morning because the day just goes crazy and then the next thing you know, you're going to bed and it starts all over again. Morning, plugging in, seeking God. Fill me fresh. I don't want anything from you but your word. I don't want anything from you but a fresh touch of your spirit. I'm not going to go through the litany of what I need you to do. I'm asking you to show me who you are. And then out of that, we're transformed. Out of that, life begins to spring forth. Out of that, we begin to have the tolerance for things that used to disrupt us. Out of that, somebody looks at your life and goes, man, you are different. What is it? It's Jesus. It's the Word of God. Because Jesus is the Word of God. And if you want to know Jesus... You've got to know the word. You've got to know who he is. So the second thing he said was to repent. To repent 
of our own selfish nature, to repent of whatever God shows you to repent. You know, and in the turn of it, the repent, it's metanuo, which is a, a compound of meta and nu. And the word means to turn. And nous means mind. So as it begins to shift here, a lot of times, you know, you meet somebody and they're, they're emotionally moved, but they wouldn't repent until they were emotionally moved. So something happened within their life. Maybe God moved on them, which is great. But it's a mental process that you say, you know what, this is wrong. I have done this, and I'm going to step back, and I'm going to say, Lord, I repent. I make a willful, conscious, mental choice. Sometimes the emotions are involved, but that's not the, that's not the litmus that says he was repentant. It's not that he was remorseful that shows that he was repentant. We've all been around people that have repented and just broken and cried and the next day without doing it again. God does a process, but it's also using our mind which transforms our being as we step into this place and we repent and we move into this and we allow him to take control. The third one was to go back to the way it was. To remember what you did, he told the church. Go back to your zealousness. Go back to your love for God. That's where he pointed it back. And on the outside, the church looks great. But Jesus can see through the outside. And we all know what's in our life, myself included. We can live a pretty polished life and have a whole trunk full of junk that nobody knows about. But God does. God knows what's going on in the trunk. And he's looking and he's going, it's time to empty the trunk. And so when he said to them, I'll remove your golden lampstand, you know, at first it's like, I'll I'll destroy you. But really what he's saying there in some commentary that I read is he's going to take the presence of God and he's going to move it. And they're going to seek after him to come back to because it's no longer there. God is such a loving God that he's not a God with a big hammer. He's not a God with a big club just looking to bam you when you make a mistake. But he's a God that says, oh, please. On. And he starts to draw, starts to draw, starts to expose whatever. So now it comes up. Now there's accountability. Now there's traction. Now it starts to draw. He's a loving, caring God. And his heart is that we understand his heart. And the way we understand it is by delighting ourselves, by leaning into it. John, in the New Testament, at the Last Supper, points out he had his head on Jesus' chest. He leaned into it. Where do we sit? Do we sit? Another one that might come to your mind is Mary and Martha. Martha, Mary sat and Martha worked. And part of the concept then was in that relational culture, when the rabbi came, you opened your house. You busted out the food because it was an honor to have this man of God come and sit and be in your presence. You be in his presence as he shares the things of God. It was common. So if a rabbi rolled up on your house, you knew what was happening because it was a privilege. As we lose these things because the cultural shift, we didn't grow up in that culture. Some of the texts don't glare out to us like that, the idioms that are in there. But in our culture, we have to choose to slow down. We have to choose to sit at his feet. We have to choose to allow him, his aroma to come upon us. Because that's the aspect of the alabaster box that was broken on his feet. The ointment that went so far. Those who didn't understand judged and said, what are you doing with such a waste? Jesus said, stop, this will go forever. And those will know of what it is because she's just anointed me in my task of what I'm here to do. And his scent went on and went on and went on. That's where we have to come back to the understanding and ask God for fresh taste buds within this heart, taste buds that hunger after him. Psalm says, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's an aspect that we have to make the choice. Delight yourself in, it's a choice. Letting him focus that part back into us will revolutionize and transform us where we can be the vessel that he wants us to be, the one that carries the aroma. So as the worship team comes up, I want to just give you an opportunity within your mind. I'm not going to have you come up here doing that stuff. Unless you really want to, just leave today and come on up. But 
ask God, is there any area in my life, my life that I'm delighting in that's not delighting for you, that you're pleased with? Is there any area that I need to throw off? Hebrews 12 speaks of this. Throw off those things that so easily entangle you and run the race that's set before you. So we all know that little creepers come in in our lives. They're not bad, but they're time suckers. They're mind shifters. They're things that steal away. Just ask the Lord, is there anything within my circle that's problematic for the depth you want to have with me. Because all of us that sit in this room that say Jesus Christ is Lord and even those that haven't met him, his heart is crying out to you to say, I want this place with you. I am the creator of the entire universe and I choose you to come sit with me. Father, we, we ask that you by your Holy Spirit just show us because so many times we pick up things. In the grass, we pick up hitchhikers. In our life, we pick up hitchhikers that steal away. Maybe they're not bad, but they steal away from what your desire for us is. And so, Lord, we pray today that as we look at your word and the joy that comes from delighting in your word, the power that lies within your word, the power of the meditation of you and your word being alive within us, and changing us. Lord, we want that. I want that. So would you have your way and draw us to that place? Because in our own volition, we can't do it. We can try, but we will fail. But when your spirit draws and when you ignite, nothing can quench that spirit. So Lord, we say have your way. Have your way and release your spirit in us. Oh, to draw us to that place of face-to-face intimacy and the sense of your aroma would be on us.